not only is the dead guy on the floor still alive, he's also the bad guy. And spoilers for the following Scooby-Doo episodes. In this iteration of the Scooby Gang, Fred is apparently a trained hang glider pilot. He enters a contest held at a Canyon Top Dude Ranch, only to learn that in addition to his competitors, he's also sharing the sky with a prehistoric flying monster. Up there you can fly for miles. And like you can drop for miles too. Yeah. Shaggy and Scooby are so preoccupied with how far the drop is, they don't even notice that no one's driving the mystery machine. Mr. Bohannon, the manager of the Big Canyon Dude Ranch, along with his partner Johnny, ran a scheme to pirate hit songs recorded off the radio by manufacturing their own vinyl albums and cassette tapes to illegally sell to music stores. In other words, these guys were making money doing what every kid with a cassette recorder has been doing since the invention of the cassette recorder. Of course, pirating music is a lot easier today with the internet. When they were in high school, a very close relative of mine managed to finance their Xbox purchases solely through selling burned CDs of songs they downloaded from Napster and LimeWire. To transport their contraband, Johnny flew a modified hang glider carrying their records on cassettes from their hidden production studio at the top of the canyon to their warehouse below, where they would then ship their merchandise to music stores in a vehicle disguised as a catering truck. After curious locals began noticing the hang glider trips, Bohannon and Johnny decided their best option was to scare others away from their hidden cave studio. They invented the legend of a race of humanoid pterodactyls that once inhabited the area, and Johnny dressed as the ghost of one of them. He wore a costume that was essentially a wingsuit to make it appear as though he had the power of flight as he glided over the canyon. Take cover! <laughs> Chickens can come out now. You smug little b Fred, Daphne, and Velma all hid from the pterodactyl, too. On the surface, this seems like a somewhat unique villain design, as this was the first time the gang confronted music pirates. However, this episode is just a retelling of that snow ghost from the first season of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Both episodes featured a scheme involving smuggling valuables perpetrated by two villains, with one being a large guy who ran a lodge, and a ghost that could fly. Both episodes begin with the gang arriving to enjoy a sport, and feature moments where the ghost peers through a window. Both also feature a scene where the teenagers investigate a cave, and Scooby finds a bone. It's also reasonable to assume that Hanna-Barbera even based both Mr. Bohannon and Mr. Greenway on the same old Hollywood actor, Sidney Greenstreet. Though the two villains had different voice actors, it sounds like both were doing their best to imitate the real-life inspiration for their characters. Little is unique with this design, as it boils down to a bog-standard Scooby villain scheme, with the bad guys using a monster to scare people away. The only thing that sets it apart would be what they were smuggling. Considering how important music was in the genesis of the Scooby gang, it's remarkable that a plot involving pirated rock songs took this long to arrive in the franchise. Though stolen music would be central to the villain's crimes, in multiple episodes of the Scooby-Doo show. Meddling kids, you ruined a perfect million-dollar operation! After getting caught, Bohannon claimed the gang ruined a million-dollar operation. So if we take him at his word, the scheme was profitable, and even split between the two men, it would be well worth the risk. You'll notice I said, if we take him at his word, because I have my doubts, which I'll go into in more detail later. The music pirating scheme wasn't that original and borrowed heavily from what came before. It was, however, purportedly profitable, so I'll give it a design score of at least 2 out of 5. Right off the bat, I want to address the biggest issue I have with the pterodactyl ghost. Or should I say, address again. Yikes! A ghost! A pterodactyl ghost! Why is Ghost the default for the Scooby gang? What makes them always assume that's what's chasing them? Especially here. 
This monster is neither transparent nor glowing, and while it does appear to be flying, it's clearly a flying creature. If Bohannon and Johnny had picked a vulture or a bald eagle as the costume, would Shaggy and Velma have been yelling about a bird ghost? Okay, here the pterodactyl ghost is shown to be glowing, but this is the only time that happens. It doesn't help that it's preceded by the sound of thunder, despite there being no rain in the episode, so the viewer is left wondering if lightning happened to strike at that precise moment. The only time anything is acknowledged by the gang to glow is a fire set by a side character, and nobody finds any phosphorus paint by the end of the episode. I'm chalking this one up to the usual carelessness by Hanna-Barbera. After all, it's not the only time this episode featured an unexplained moment. Boy, am I glad to see you. You know, we thought this whole cave was haunted. Haunted? Let me out of here! <laughs> this talking skeleton had nothing to do with anything else in the episode and is never brought up again. Was this a real ghost that happened to be haunting the cave? Or were there two separate, unrelated villain schemes taking place in the same general area? Maybe the manager can explain that weird-looking ghost we saw. If Bohannon and Johnny's costume was supposed to be a ghost, then it will be judged as one and ranked accordingly. Which, as you might be able to tell, won't be doing it any favors. I've already discussed the special effects, or rather the lack of any. The only traditional spirit attribute exhibited by the pterodactyl ghost is the ability to fly. And even that's limited to just gliding, because the costume is merely a heavily modified hang glider. Can pterodactyls go through walls? I doubt it. Let's have a look. There was one moment in the episode where the ghost might have been considered able to walk through walls, but that is immediately and smugly dismissed by Fred. Perhaps because they were following a set of footprints, and ghosts shouldn't be able to leave those either. This is another one of those situations where a monster being a ghost should be less frightening than if it was just a monster. In the scooby doo universe, ghosts are seldom, if ever, truly non-corporeal. Even the ones that float and can walk through walls are still able to directly interact with the physical world, when being a ghost should have meant not having that ability. Thus, the spirit of a monster like a pterodactyl man should be considered less scary as a ghost, because by being intangible, it shouldn't be able to cause any physical harm with its claws or beak. Of course, that ship has long sailed, because while the gang have occasionally observed how a ghost they were investigating should have been able to leave a physical clue, this is generally ignored. Since it's a given that ghosts in the Scooby franchise are expected to be able to physically hurt their victims, the pterodactyl ghost would be considered dangerous, just like any other monster with teeth and talons. Apart from that, though, the costume isn't that disturbing. This may be the fault of the animators, who weren't able to convey the necessary sense of menace needed by the script. Honestly, to me the pterodactyl ghost just looks like a guy wearing a green bodysuit. Setting aside the headpiece, if you saw him walking down the street, you'd think he was a member of a visual effects crew on their way to a film set. What might be the most frightening part of the entire costume was its screeching. But that's just the standard bird of prey shriek used all the time by Hanna-Barbera. This makes the scariest thing about the pterodactyl ghost its least original aspect. Even the concept of a prehistoric creature coming to life isn't new for the scooby doo universe, as we've already seen a frozen two-million-year-old caveman. Flying creatures have also been used before, as we saw in the episode where the gang were chased by a giant vulture. A vulture that used the same sound effect for its scream as the pterodactyl ghost. While it's not Hanna-Barbera, Marvel Comics already featured a supervillain that was essentially a pterodactyl-human hybrid whose first appearance predated this Scooby episode by nearly a decade. This guy is named Sauron, by the way, and yes, he was literally named after the Lord of the Rings. Millions of years ago, this canyon was filled with dinosaurs and pterodactyls. Some people believe the pterodactyls evolved into man-like flying creatures. It could at least be said that the pterodactyl ghost's costume was appropriate for the setting, considering both the legend of the pterodactyl people and the need for quick escapes down to the canyon floor. However, the former was just another invention by the villains who made up the legend in the first place. 
It worked fine until folks spotted the hang glider flights and got curious. That's when Bohannon dreamed up that phony pterodactyl legend to scare everybody away from the caves. While the story might work for tourists, I can't help but think that if any locals happened to hear about it from an out-of-towner, they'd laugh it off and ask where in the hell they heard such a ridiculous tall tale. This could only undermine Bohannon and Johnny's cover story. Attention, all contestants. Prepare for the safety inspection. Well, I'm all set. I'm sorry. But what the hell is up with Daphne's head? I know in traditional cell animation, they don't bother drawing characters realistically when it's a far shot. But come on. Look out, Scoob! <laughs> This is why you leash your dog. Worst dog owners ever. Zoinks! It's it! Why go through the hassle of making those stone skateboards, guys? What happened to your bicycle helicopter? Helicopter. There was one final drawback to the costume that I'm saving until the next section, because it relates to a major problem with the entire scheme. The pterodactyl ghost wasn't very original and only mildly scary. It featured few special effects and was frankly miscategorized as a ghost. Though even if it was considered just a monster like Sasquatch or the Yeti, it still wasn't that disturbing considering the lack of menace it exuded. I'm giving Bohannon and Johnny a 2 out of 5 for the outfit. There are so many things wrong with Bohannon and Johnny's apparition that it's difficult to decide where to begin. It would help before we start to determine exactly what kind of music pirates they were, because it does have some bearing on the feasibility of their operation and their odds of getting caught. While the terms bootlegging and counterfeiting are often used interchangeably when describing pirated music, there is a difference between them. Bootlegging is when a seller compiles an unofficial release of an artist's work. Examples would be selling secretly recorded concert performances or stolen outtakes and alternate takes from a recording studio. It would also include producing a compilation album by collecting any number of songs from legitimate sources, like other albums or tracks recorded off the radio. Usually, a bootleg album is instantly recognizable as such. Many don't feature package art and are often not even sold, but rather traded among fans who then make their own copies to keep spreading the songs to others. Counterfeiting, on the other hand, is when music pirates do their best to recreate an officially released album, duplicating both the sound and the packaging with the goal that a buyer wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Counterfeiters usually try making copies from as legitimate a source as possible, either by purchasing a real album from a music store and making copies from that, or in the case of the more sophisticated groups, obtaining original aluminum master discs from vinyl record pressing plants. Granted, the final counterfeit copy wouldn't sound as good as one produced by the studio, since there is always a degradation of quality when you make a copy of a copy. But the goal is to fool the consumer into buying what they think is a legitimate version of the album. Without having to pay any licensing or contract fees, a music pirate would make significantly more money from a sale than the original studio. So why am I dwelling so much on the distinction between bootlegs and counterfeits? Most legitimate music stores don't sell bootlegs, because it would be obvious they were selling what would be considered stolen merchandise. This would be bad for the pirates as well, as it would be easy for investigators to trace the bootleg supply route all the way back to them. Logically then, for Bohannon and Johnny to have been as successful as they claimed, they had to have been producing counterfeit copies of legitimate albums and not bootlegs. But if that was the case, why were they sourcing their songs off radio broadcasts when all they had to do was buy one legitimate copy of the music they were duplicating? Indeed, radio recordings would be among the worst choices for source material because not only would the sound quality be much worse than from directly off an official record or cassette, but radio DJs often speak over the beginning and ending of the songs they play, requiring the counterfeiters to crop off large sections of the tracks. This brings up another question. What kind of records and cassettes were Bohannon and Johnny counterfeiting? Were they dealing with full albums filled with multiple songs? Or were they just selling singles? 
Yeah, that cassette doesn't even have a label on it. Let's see what it is. Wow, it's Elvis John's latest hit single. Ah, yes. The famous 1970s rock star Elvis John, almost as well known as the Beach Brothers and Sly and the Family Rolling Stones. The only mention of any of the pirated songs was in the form of a single, so it's possible that the counterfeiters were producing those and not full albums, which would make sense if they were simply reselling songs recorded off the radio. However, we saw a burned purchase order showing that a music store was paying $12,000 for 6,000 records and cassettes, which would imply a wholesale amount of $2 each. At the time, full albums were sold for around $7, while mere singles were often sold for no more than a single dollar. The music stores were not likely to pay a wholesale price of twice as much as the sales price, so it can be inferred that Bohannon and Johnny were selling full albums and not singles. This is further supported later when Velma is shown holding up full-sized vinyl records and not the smaller 45s that singles were typically sold as. Now that we've established that the music pirates were selling full counterfeit albums, this makes where they got their songs make even less sense. Setting aside the sound quality and DJ chatter, most records weren't played in their entirety on the radio. Unless an album was filled with nothing but top 10 hits, some of those songs would never be played over the air making it impossible for Bohannon and Johnny to counterfeit a record in its entirety. Even if they did manage to record every song off the radio, the pirates would still have to painstakingly piece them together correctly on a master recording to be duplicated. This was an unnecessarily convoluted way of sourcing their stolen music. Mm. Uh, uh, uh. Ah. Creepers! A secret switch! No, I'm fairly certain that's just a regular switch just sitting there on the wall where everyone can see it. There's nothing secret about it. Let's find out what somebody was trying to hide behind this phony wall. A room full of recording equipment. Yeah, but what's it doing in this cave? What was the point of the music pirates keeping their production studio separate from the warehouse where they stored their counterfeit goods? This is reminiscent of how Dr. Coffin hid the smelter in the sanitarium while storing the gold bars and bread wrapping equipment elsewhere. By splitting up their operation like that, Bohannon and Johnny were doubling the chances of getting caught. I think this is where he was going when he saw us. They didn't even try to make it look like anyone was driving the mystery machine. Unless he has landing gear, someone else drove a car in. Looks like our ghost is meeting somebody who's real flesh and blood. There has been literally nothing in the entire episode that would make the pterodactyl ghost appear to be a ghost. Remember, even the one time that it looked like it might have been able to walk through walls, Fred immediately dismissed the idea. By adding the unnecessary step of flying the contraband down from the top of the canyon, the villains drew the attention of locals who saw the hang glider, which led to Bohannon and Johnny inventing the pterodactyl ghost, which then led to the gang's involvement, which led to this scheme getting busted. Again, just like how the unnecessary step of transporting the bricks by ambulance led the teenagers to find Dr. Coffin's secret cave hideout and capturing the gold smugglers. This aspect of the operation is also the biggest flaw in the entire plan, one which anyone who ever went sledding down a hill will immediately recognize. Hang gliders are a one-way trip. Once Johnny landed at the warehouse, that meant he had to disassemble his glider, pack it up, and either drag it or drive it back up to the top of the canyon. After all, Hang gliders typically weigh anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds, making it extremely cumbersome to carry by hand. This is the biggest drawback to the design of the pterodactyl ghost as well. It's only going to be able to fly if it starts from the top of the canyon. The fact that it can't take off from ground level is a major indication that it wasn't a real ghost, let alone half-man, half-flying dinosaur. Well, millions of years ago, this canyon was filled with dinosaurs and pterodactyls. Whoops, did I say flying dinosaur? My mistake. As often as the Scooby writers get the science wrong, they deserve credit for knowing that dinosaurs and pterodactyls aren't the same thing. Gliding down to the warehouse and dragging the hang glider back to the top wouldn't be that much of an issue if Johnny only had to do it a handful of times. But let's look at the math. Oh, sh**.
math. Setting aside the initial costs of the processing and recording equipment, to make a million dollars, as claimed by Bohannon, and selling a product at $2 each, as implied by the music store purchase order, the villains would have had to produce and ship no less than 500,000 counterfeit vinyl records and cassette tapes. On average, a typical vinyl record with its cover weighed around 7 ounces, while an audio cassette inside a case weighed around 3 ounces. If we assume the pirates sold an equal number of vinyl records and cassettes, 250,000 units of each would weigh close to 80 tons. The amount of weight hang gliders can carry depends on the size and shape, but what we see on screen doesn't look that dissimilar to a standard model with a typical maximum weight capacity of 250 pounds. Hang in there, Scooby! Title drop! Also, there's no way that Fred's standard hang glider could have carried the three of them like that, as their combined weight would have easily surpassed 250 pounds. For the sake of argument, let's be generous and assume Johnny's hang glider could at least match the carrying capacity of a tandem unit, setting the maximum weight capacity at 500 pounds. Johnny appeared to be of average height but lean, so he probably weighed close to 150 pounds, allowing for 350 pounds of storage weight for the records and cassettes. 80 tons at 350 pounds per trip would mean Johnny would have to make over 450 trips to the Canyon Bottom. This, however, was a best-case scenario and not borne out by what we saw in the episode. 350 pounds would be the equivalent of either 800 vinyl records or 1,800 cassette tapes. But what we saw was just three canvas bags attached to the glider. As this was nowhere near the capacity of the hypothetical 500 pounds, it can be inferred that Johnny's special glider couldn't carry that much more weight than a standard one. If the maximum capacity of Johnny's hang glider was 250 pounds, that would allow for just 100 pounds of extra storage, meaning Johnny would have to make over 1,600 trips to the canyon bottom. If I lived next to the lodge, I'd wonder what was up with so many hang glider flights too. All these assumptions are based on Bohannon's claim that the gang had ruined a million dollar operation. But the more you think about it, the more this sounds like the villain was just bragging about his scheme, and it wasn't anywhere close to being that valuable. Especially as I haven't even touched on how much money Bohannon and Johnny would have had to shell out in initial expenses. The equipment needed for audio cassette recording is simple enough that it could be purchased off the shelf in most electronic stores at the time. Pressing vinyl records, however, required highly specialized and expensive production facilities to stamp metal master discs onto soft vinyl biscuits to mold into the shape of a record. It couldn't possibly be cost-effective to assemble the necessary processing equipment to create counterfeit vinyl albums and only sell them for $2 each. In real life, pirated vinyl records are often imported from other countries because it's a lot easier to turn a legitimate pressing factory overseas into one making counterfeit albums rather than a couple of music pirates building their own factory from scratch. If we take what we saw on screen at face value, just to afford the manufacturing equipment, Bohannon and Johnny would have had to sell a hell of a lot more counterfeit merchandise than my earlier estimates making this operation make even less sense. It's also questionable how any equipment could be installed in a cave system when considering the power requirements needed to run everything. I can't imagine an electric utility company laying lines to a random canyon cave without asking a few questions. Okay, maybe we know one guy who might have been willing to do it for the right price. The music pirates made their recordings in an underground studio we found in an old cave above the ranch. By the way, the flashback shows a third unidentified man in the background. Was he the skeleton that Shaggy and Scooby ran into earlier? Incidentally, it was also dumb for the villains to accept checks for their counterfeit goods, because that's just more of a paper trail for investigators to follow. If Bohannon and Johnny really wanted to make money, they should have given up on pirating music and focused on the commercial applications of the wingsuit they created for their pterodactyl disguise. That would have given them a 20-year head start in the industry. Jeepers! Cave carvings! And look! Fresh carvings on that monster! And he's got Scooby! Wait a minute. Who carved these images? And why? 
I could perhaps see the villains creating the first two pterodactyl people on the wall as a way of bolstering their made-up legend, but what was the point of the Scooby one? If Johnny had captured Scooby and hid him behind a wall, why would he leave directions for anyone looking for the dog? If the idea was to lure the others into a trap, that would be one thing. But it's clear from how easily Scooby leaves the room, that was not the intention. Shoo. And double shoo. Wait a minute. Where did the mystery machine come from? Scooby flew the hang glider to the cave, and the others walked to get there. Their van should still have been parked at the ranch. I cannot in good conscience give Bohannon and Johnny an operation score any higher than a 1 out of 5. Examining their scheme is like playing a hidden object game. The more you look at it, the more things you find wrong with it. This leaves the pterodactyl ghost with a final due score of 1.7 out of 5. You ruined a perfect million dollar operation! Stop him! You're the sheriff. You stop him. He's a giant fat guy escaping on foot. Not Steve Looker. He'll probably collapse from exhaustion before he even reaches his car. The gang and Scooby Dum visit another one of Scooby Doo's cousins, Scooby D, on a movie set where she is starring in the lead role. Once there, they find themselves acting as her bodyguards after she receives a threatening letter from the spirit of a silent film star, angry that his most famous performance is being remade. Oh no, Scooby Doo, come back! Oh, stop him! This is why you leash your dog. Both of them. Worst dog owners ever. Cut! Cut! Get those crazy hounds off the set! Filming a single scene in a movie requires the work of many professionals. Lighting, camera, set staging, floor marks, electrical rigging, hair and makeup, etc. In addition, this was long before digital photography, and everything that happened when the cameras were rolling not only used up expensive film stock, but also took additional time and money to process. Scooby-Doo and Scooby-Dum likely cost the producers a few thousand dollars with their shenanigans. Along with museums, film sets should be included on the list of places that need to ban the Scooby gang, considering their history of causing trouble at them. Like they were only acting, Scooby-Dum. You know Cousin D's an actress. Where in the hell are Shaggy's feet? In fact, how is he even standing like that behind the couch when his legs would be too long for that? Greedy studio chief Jim Moss planned to replace popular canine film star Scooby D with a look-alike dog that only obeyed him. To hide his involvement, he dressed as the phantom of Milo Booth, a ghost of an old silent film star who died 20 years earlier. This was also meant to explain why the fake Scooby D would no longer follow anyone else's instructions as she would be so traumatized by the Phantom that she would only trust and listen to Moss. This led me to question the fundamental nature of the Scooby-Doo universe to the point where it almost gave me an existential crisis. We now have two more talking dogs in the series. We started with Scooby-Doo, then we met Scooby-Dum, and now Scooby-D. We know, unfortunately, that the Scooby family contains multiple members who can speak so it's easy to wave away their use of human speech as a quirk of their family tree. Except we also met another unrelated talking dog in this episode. What kind of agency do dogs have in the Scooby-Doo universe? Think about it. We're not dealing with simple canines acting purely on instinct and training, but rather sentient beings capable of expressing themselves enough to star in Hollywood films. Uh, this is Jim Moss, our studio chief. Hi. And Rod Kennedy is a dog trainer, better known as Scooby-D's dramatic coach. Hi, kids. While animal actors are nothing new in the movie industry, typically they're treated as the property of their owners and trainers who pocket all the money they earn. It's common for them to have agents, but the animals themselves aren't going to be signing the back of any checks. Though introduced as a dog trainer, it's interesting that the writers chose to refer to Kennedy as a dramatic coach. It's almost as if they realized while drafting the script that it was weird to treat a talking dog like any other animal. It's one thing to use treats, 
to train a dog to involuntarily perform tricks upon demand, but quite another thing when the animal in question can simply be asked to do what's needed with words. If Scooby-Dee is treated as a person and not just a dog, this implies she is able to act under her own free will and presumably pay her own living expenses, as well as to pick and choose acting roles, not to mention hire and fire her own agents, coaches, or assistants. She would, after all, again presumably, be the one putting her own paw print on the back of any checks her acting performances earn. The fact that Scooby-Dee was an award-winning dog actor would imply that there should be a considerable amount of profit to be made around her. So then, how exactly would Moss get any money from his scheme? Imagine we weren't talking about a dog actor, but instead a normal human one. What if someone managed to replace, say, Scarlett Johansson with a body double? Would that double split their acting checks with the mastermind of the scheme? What would be their motive to continue to do so? Fear of exposure? Whoever helped them replace the original actor would be opening themselves up to prosecution, too. As a studio chief, Moss was likely already earning money from Scooby-Dee in the form of a salary. Unless he also became their agent, it wouldn't matter who the actor was in any given role assigned by the studio. This scheme only makes sense if Moss would be considered to be Scooby-Dee's owner, something we've already established she doesn't have or need. Are all dogs sentient in the Scooby-Doo universe? If that's the case, wouldn't that mean the country would have to accommodate them at restaurants, movie theaters, grocery stores, and anywhere else that humans are allowed? To do otherwise just means mass discrimination against what are essentially just hairier versions of people. I'm going to stop here because this video is meant to discuss the villain in the episode. But I just wanted to share with you why every episode that features another talking dog besides Scooby is a bit of a mind f for me every time. This is not the first time a villain scheme involved dressing up as a monster from the silent film era, though in the case of Zalia Fairchild and Lauren Chumley, they themselves were the actual silent film stars, whereas in this episode, Moss pretended to be the ghost of a silent film star. So I'm not sure if this would make the plot original or not. Kidnapping also plays a significant part of his plan, but for a change, this won't count against Moss, as his design hinges on replacing Scooby-D, and if successful, would keep anyone from even knowing the original was missing in the first place. However, this was also not the first time that dognapping was the central part of the villain's plot, so there's nothing original about this either. You know they're cousins. Right? It's been mentioned before that Hanna-Barbera habitually ignores one massive plot hole that encompasses the entire Scooby-Doo universe. The fact that, as a dog, Scooby's sense of smell should be good enough that he would be able to tell right away who the villain was in any given episode just from their odor. If you think about it, to Scooby, nasally speaking, every bad guy should look like Superman wearing his glasses pretending to be Clark Kent. The first time any villain appears in their monster disguise, Scooby should immediately be able to say, Hey everybody, the ape man smells like Carl the Runtman. Run Carl the Runtman. As horny for Scooby-Dee as Scooby-Doo and Scooby-Dum were, it should have been apparent to either of the latter that their cousin didn't smell the same and was clearly a different dog in disguise. However, as mentioned, this is an aspect of Scooby's design that is consistently ignored in every iteration of the gang, and thus won't count against Moss. Most of the design here felt borrowed from earlier episodes, and there's no clear way to guarantee any profit from it. Moss would also have to maintain a constant disguise on the replacement dog, which potentially means years of worrying about getting caught. I'm giving his dog napping scheme a 1 out of 5. It wasn't original or profitable enough to justify so much risk. Remember earlier when I complained how quickly the gang are to label everything a ghost? Well, they're doing it again in this episode by referring to Milo Booth as a phantom. Like, what's happening in here? It is Milo Booth! This is such a weird scene and totally not in character for the Scooby gang. Typically, when the monster first shows up, they all run away, and it's not until near the end after they gather all the clues that the monster isn't real, 
that Fred and the rest try to catch them. The only other time I can recall any of them physically fighting the monster this early in the episode is when Scooby beat up Carl. And look there! Milo Boo's crimp. Jinkies, it's empty! It looks like Milo Boo did come back from the dead! In addition to the usual ignoring of clues that the ghost was just as tangible as anything else, like the ability to leave notes on mirrors, assault innocent rail employees, or Fred literally grabbing hold of the bad guy, the gang also visit the alleged ghost's crypt and observe that its body was missing, implying Milo Booth rose from the grave. Ghosts don't rise from graves. Zombies do, as well as vampires and other forms of the undead. Setting aside the mislabeling of the villain, we've already had episodes featuring disguises based on the works of silent film stars. In fact, stylistically, Milo Booth doesn't look that different from Mr. Hyde from the Sandy Duncan episode. Both costumes featured ghastly faces and styles of dress reminiscent of the late 19th century, including hats and capes. Moss didn't even show enough initiative to include any special effects to augment his disguise. It was as generic as you could get. I will admit the face was scary and likely to disturb many children in the audience, but that's all it really had going for it. The Phantom of Milo Booth gets an outfit score of 1.5 out of 5. Oh yeah, there was another disguise in the episode in the form of Moss's dog dressing up as Scooby-Dee, but that wasn't much of a costume either. It wasn't meant to scare anyone away, nor did it need any special effects, because its sole purpose was to fool the world into thinking the fake was Scooby-Dee. I've got an idea. We'll disguise Scooby-Doo to look like Scooby-Dee. Good idea. Me? A girl? <laughs> Wait a minute. Scooby doesn't want to dress up as a girl? As poorly as Moss implemented his scheme, I'm frankly amazed he was able to get as far as he did with it. <laughs> Hello, dearie. <gasps> Why, you and me! What's the point of the muzzle? It doesn't seem to be keeping Scooby-Dee from speaking. Is that your beautiful face I see? Yeah! <laughs> and stay out! Beat it! <laughs> the train company is lucky this is long before TripAdvisor and Yelp because there would be a lot of negative reviews from all these passengers whose sleep was interrupted by a couple of dogs being allowed to wander around the sleeping apartment. Uh, would you do it for a Scooby-Dee kiss, huh? <laughs> oh boy, you bet, sure. No, let me try. You know they're cousins, right? They sure don't kiss like Scooby-Dee. That's cause she's not Scooby-Dee. Literally, the only thing Moss was able to successfully accomplish was kidnapping Scooby-Dee and even that only worked briefly, as it didn't take long for the fake to get exposed. It also begs the question, what was he planning on doing with the real Scooby-Dee? Keeping her captive forever wasn't a viable option. Even if he smuggled her out of the state, it's not like he could stick her on a farm somewhere, because the moment anyone else saw her, she would undoubtedly tell them what was going on and ask for help. His only option was to kill her, and Moss didn't seem to be that bloodthirsty. But why did he lure us here to Boothville? Now that you know the truth, you will never get out! The closest he came to murder was locking the gang up in the Booth family mausoleum, and even that was half-hearted at best. This wasn't like trapping them in a locked room underground. It wouldn't take long for a graveyard keeper to hear the cries of the trapped teens yelling for help. Not that the gang weren't able to escape on their own. A loose stone. We need one more person. 
Why is Scooby dumb in that position? We all know who's supposed to be at the bottom of the Scooby Gang totem pole. That's it for all the things Moss got right. Now for all the things he got wrong. Enjoying your visit to the set? We sure are, Mr. Mogul. Your picture looks great. Wait a minute. The studio executive is named Mr. Mogul? Wow. The writers weren't even trying. Y'all look so nice. <laughs> you know they're cousins, right? I want Scooby-Dee guarded every second on the train trip back to the West Coast tonight. Yes, Mr. Mogul. We'll pull out in a few minutes. If anything goes wrong, we'll be in our compartments up front. Right, Mr. Moss. See you kids in the morning. Those two were told to guard Scooby-Dee every second on the trip back to California. But they're leaving her alone in her own train car? Moss was the villain. So what was Kennedy's excuse? Look at this! They're loading a coffin aboard the baggage car. <laughs> oh. It's the conductor. I was sitting here reading the paper and suddenly this, this terrible face rose up from the coffin. The Phantom! What was the point of hiding in the coffin? Moss was already aboard the train and he had planned on letting the others see him dressed as the Phantom. Yet for some reason, he felt it necessary to sneak back to the baggage car, hide in the coffin, and attack the conductor when the man was taking a newspaper break. All this did was needlessly increase the chances of getting caught and adding assault charges when Moss was inevitably arrested. You can relax now, Scooby-Dee. Yeah, the Phantom wouldn't dare come in here. Where's Daphne getting that confidence? The Phantom! Now oh, I have you at last! Why would Moss attempt to kidnap Scooby-Dee when she was surrounded by witnesses, including a somewhat beefy teenaged boy who looks like he could easily bench 220? As we saw, Moss was easily overpowered by Fred, and it was only dumb luck that allowed him to escape. <laughs> Passing through that little town, Boothville. Look! The Phantom! Where is he going? Where else? Back to his grave. We better check out Boothville if we're going to solve this mystery. What was the point of uncoupling the train car and stranding everyone in Boothville? It would have made sense if Moss and Scooby D had been the only ones on that car while everyone else continued to California. This would have allowed the villain to get rid of his victim without anyone catching him. However, this would have also meant that Moss would not be on the train when it arrived at its destination, making him look very suspicious. I suppose when questioned, he could have claimed he'd been on the car looking for Scooby-D when it was left behind, but this would still elevate him to near the top of the suspect list for anyone paying attention. Here we are, gang. The Boothville Cemetery. Here it is. The Booth Family Mausoleum. And look, there's a key in the lock. And look there! Milo Boo's crypt. Come on, let's see what's inside. It's empty! But what did he do with the real Milo Booth's body? Nothing. He just switched the nameplate to an empty coffin. Where did the empty coffin come from? We see several others in the same mausoleum, but it's unlikely any in there would have been empty for Moss to use, particularly the one that seemed to be dead center. This implies he would have had to bring in his own empty coffin and move the one that had been on the stone plinth. A regular wooden coffin isn't exactly light enough for a single man to easily move, let alone a stone sarcophagus. We know the empty one is made of stone because not only did it take both Fred and Velma to slide the lid, we clearly hear the sound of grating stone. How could one man have been able to do that? It would have made much more sense for Moss to have moved the body directly and not bother with switching coffins. The real Milo Booth died 20 years earlier, so it's likely, even with the best embalming, he would have been nothing but bones by that point. Moss could have simply stashed the remains in one of the other coffins in the mausoleum. It's not like desecrating bodies is anything new in the Scooby-Dooniverse. 
His next mistake was leaving that mausoleum key for us to find. Like it was brand new, which meant somebody wanted us to get inside to see that empty coffin. How is that a clue? It's just as conceivable that the graveyard managers had lost the original key and had a spare. This was a family mausoleum, so it's possible others would have been interred there over the years since Milo Booth's death. In addition, the roof was falling apart, which meant the graveyard staff would need access to make repairs. Look here, Shag, I found a clue. This mud. There's some in the coffin, too. More mud. Like we saw in the baggage car near the casket. Baggage car. <laughs> Never change, Frank. The mud from the casket on the train didn't match the graveyard mud, which told us he hadn't come from the grave. Setting aside how the gang would be able to determine the mud they found on the train didn't match what they found in the graveyard, why was there any mud there in the first place? Did Moss place some in the train coffin on purpose to make it appear as though the phantom had risen from the grave? Or was it there by accident because he happened to get some on his shoes when he was moving things around in the Booth family mausoleum? If it was placed there on purpose, why didn't Moss use the same mud from the graveyard? He had been right there and could have easily snagged some. If the mud was in the train coffin by accident, where did it come from? The only thing Moss had been doing that would have gotten him dirty was messing around in the graveyard. For there to have been a different type of mud meant he had to have gone out of his way to get more dirt on his shoes elsewhere. Hey, like, look, there's a fair in town, and everybody's invited to the Milo Booth Film Museum. Milo Booth? Sounds like a good place to start checking. Uh-oh, the Scooby Gang's in town. Here's hoping the museum has kept its insurance up to date. The Booth Film Museum. Well, let's go inside. How are they going to do that? It's the middle of the night, and the place is obviously closed. Oh, wait. There's a film in the projector. Let's see what it is. It's an old newsreel. You know, there's something different about it. There sure is. The Milo booth we saw didn't wear any glasses. And there's another clue. The Phantom's been here with the fake Scooby-Dee. He was probably after that film. Why would Moss need to take that film reel? Even if he was afraid that it would show the original Milo Booth wore glasses while Moss's disguise didn't, what would be the point? There had to be any number of other film reels or publicity photos showing Milo Booth wearing eyewear. If Moss was so concerned about the glasses being a problem, why didn't he wear a fake pair? Also, if he was there with the fake Scooby-Dee to get the film reel, why was it still there? Hell, why is the fact that the original Milo Booth wore glasses even a clue in the first place? He's supposed to be undead. Are you telling me that whatever dark necromantic magic reanimated his corpse was going to be foiled by a little bit of farsightedness? Why, like here he comes! Ready? Ready. My heroes! It was also embarrassingly easy for the gang to rescue Scooby-Dee. I mean, Shaggy and the Scooby cousins were literally hanging from a bridge in front of Moss, and he didn't take any steps to keep his prisoner. My hero! Ooh. You too, Cousin Dumb. No! You know they're cousins, right? There he goes! Why in the hemorrhaging f would Moss try running away by getting on a carousel? What? Weren't there any stationary exercise bikes he could ride to escape? Gotcha! No elaborate trap, no over-the-top Scooby shenanigans accidentally catching the bad guy. Moss and his dog ran inside a Ferris wheel passenger compartment, and they locked him in. Not quite as embarrassing as other villain failures, but it's right up there. Why did Moss even go through all this trouble in the first place? The Milo Booth disguise, the mausoleum coffin shuffling, kidnapping Scooby-Dee, uncoupling the train car, etc. If the whole point was to have control of a Hollywood star who happened to be a talking dog, he already had a f***ing talking dog. Granted, in this iteration of the Scooby franchise, 
talking dogs are clearly nothing too out of the ordinary. So then the only thing that sets Scooby-Dee apart from Moss's dog must be her looks. Because, let's face it, the latter wasn't going to be winning any beauty contests. However, it was established that with a simple disguise, an ugly dog could be made beautiful. So looks aren't an obstacle either. As a studio chief, Moss likely had any number of contacts in the industry. So what would have prevented him from simply writing a letter of resignation to Mr. Mogul and managing his own dog's film career. Nothing that Moss did in this episode was necessary. His entire operation was a mistake. Thus, I'm giving Jim Moss's operation a score of 1 out of 5. He's clearly one of the dumber villains in the scooby doo universe. This leaves the Phantom of Milo Booth with a final Doo score of 1.2 out of 5. You know they're cousins, right? And that's my ranking of the villains from the second set of episodes of the second season of the Scooby-Doo Show, shown here along with the ones from my previous video. Well, that was quite a sizable drop from the first two episodes, wasn't it? Whenever I give a Scooby villain such a low ranking, it does bother me a bit because I know that somewhere out there, the bad guy in question is someone's favorite. All I can say is that I do my best to be impartial, and this is just one person's opinion. Never apologize for what you like. Unless it's the Kardashians. Hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If you'd like to help support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon below but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. Patreon members receive credit in my videos for as long as they remain a paid member, as well as a personal shout out in the next regular video produced after they join. You know Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Dum, and Scooby-Dee are cousins, right?